Good morning, everybody. Okay, so before we jump into our passage, I have a shameless community life plug that I'm just going to tell you about. So uh, on Easter Sunday, you may have noticed that we have services on Sunday at 9, 10, 30, and 12 p.m. And in case you haven't heard, starting the week before that, we are going to have three services every single Sunday, 9, 10, 30, and 12 p.m. And one of the things I'm most excited about is that the 12 p.m. service is inevitably going to be smaller than the 9 and the 10.30. And while that sounds like, oh, why would you want it to be smaller? I really think that community is built in small places. I really think that in a big uh, big auditorium like this, it's really easy to slip in and slip out without being recognized. And my hope is that at the 12 p.m. service, something new starts to happen. And I'm also hoping that when we have lunches after every 12 p.m. service, right? That when we set, get to sit and eat together, there's new friendships and new relationships that are formed. And ultimately, our community grows deeper together. So that's my shameless plug for the 12 p.m. service and why you should go. All right, I'm going to pray and then we'll get to Colossians. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning and for this opportunity to gather with your people and in your presence. Lord, I pray that you would wake us up to what you have for us this morning. God, get me, get us out of the way of what you want to teach us. I pray, Lord, that um, we would we would just be open-minded and open-hearted to what your spirit wants to do in us. Make us malleable before you, Father. Um, I do pray that uh, your spirit would be thick in here and that we would not leave this place unchanged. Father, thank you for your presence and the fact that we have been raised in Christ. Put all this in the hands of your son, Jesus. Amen. I read somewhere this week this, kind of, this little quote, and it was, life is what you are alive to. And at first I thought, oh, that's a cute Pinterest quote, you know. But as soon as I was done reading it, I started thinking about it, and my mind just kept coming back to it. Life is what you are alive to. You know, if you think about it, a kid could come alive when you talk about going to get ice cream or going to play baseball with their best friends. A teenager probably comes alive when you mention prom or their driver's license. Most people actually come alive to whatever they're most passionate about and come alive when they get to lean into those things that they're passionate about. I actually went to hear this awesome Christian writer and teacher and researcher this earlier this week. His name's Andy Crouch. And it was clear he came alive as he was talking about cultural renewal for Jesus. It was like he could barely contain all of the excitement that he had inside of him, and he was sitting on the edge of his stool. And every time someone asked him a question, it was like he could, he was like bubbling up to the point where he just had to tell everybody about what not only what he knew, but also what he was seeing with what God was doing. Well, after that experience, and that Pinterest quote just kept repeating in my head over and over, I started thinking to myself and asking myself the question, well, what do I come alive to? When people come into contact with me, what gets reflected back to them about what I live for? We're now knee deep in the book of Colossians and the apostle Paul who wrote this letter would have had a very simple answer to that question for himself. And he would have said the same answer applies to every single follower of Jesus. What do we come alive to? Christ. We come alive to Christ. But if you're like me, as desperately as you want that to be true in every moment of your life, there is some disconnect between that desire and what you actually live out. Paul, in the first two letters of this, uh, first two chapters of this letter, makes it really clear Jesus, in all of his fullness, is everything we need and more to come alive, to be made brand new. But in the passage we're going to look at today, he takes what he's told the church about how we're, made, we're to be made brand new because of Christ, and he switches to showing us how we actually come into that life. So if you have your Bibles, open them with me to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to see in this first part of the passage that we have been raised with Christ. So that means that we have to set our affections on heavenly things. 
I'm going to start reading at verse 1. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. About a year and a half ago, I moved into a new apartment that actually happened to be a different apartment in the same building where I was living before. And I can't even tell you how many times in the weeks after I moved, I accidentally walked all the way up the stairs to my old apartment over and over again. And every time I'd open the door because it was unlocked because they were redoing everything. And there was like paint cans and all kinds of stuff in there. I'm like, well, this is no longer my apartment, and I just wasted about 25 steps. It's awesome. Uh, and then, it's in the same way, when the New North offices moved from Burlingame to Daly City last September, I drove to the old offices five times. Five times. Each time realizing there is nothing for me here. I don't know whether that shows how oblivious I am while I'm driving or walking, apparently, but I think it illustrates what Paul is saying in these first verses. You belong where Christ is now, so set your course, your thoughts, your heart, your affections there. And just like there was nothing left for me in my old stomping grounds, what Paul calls earthly things are not where our thoughts or where our hearts belong either. You've been raised with Christ. You've moved. You've moved. When we become followers of Jesus, we are in essence changing our, where we belong entirely. It's not simply a tweak in the way that we see things or a tweak in the way that we understand things. It's not just like some aha moment. It's a 180 degree turn from what was formerly true about you to a new life. The world no longer orbits around you. You orbit around Christ. Paul here is saying since that that fundamental thing is true about you. It's a done deal. Your life isn't about you anymore. You've risen with Christ. Your old life is dead. Since that is true, set your minds on, aspire to, pursue, long for things above, heavenly things that reflect that new life in Christ. But Paul continues in verse three. He says, he says, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Paul claims our life is now hidden with Christ. So not only does it belong to him, but it's hidden with him. I think the fact that our lives are hidden with Christ is quite possibly one of the most encouraging things Paul could have said to us. Because if your life is hidden with him, first, it means that you're safe. It means you're safe. We hide things we want to keep safe, right? Being hidden is not the same thing as being lost. And things that are hidden are out of danger. Paul says in, the letter to, in his letter to the Romans, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. It's like Paul's reminding us, your life, because it's hidden with him, it's not going to be taken. It can't be lost. It's safe. But second, if your life is hidden with him, it also means that what you're experiencing is to be expected. Have any of you ever been to the doctor with some symptom, and by the time you actually get to the doctor, you WebMD'd yourself into thinking that you're going to die? Okay, I've done that before. The most comforting thing a doctor can say to you in a moment like that is, oh, don't worry about it. It's totally normal. That's like the best thing that a doctor can say. Oh, it's totally normal. Paul here is doing exactly the same thing. He's doing exactly the same thing because the fullness of who Jesus is is not evident to everyone yet. Not everybody understands who he is. We are going to feel this disjointedness in some ways from people who haven't given their lives to him yet. We're going to feel disjointed from the rest of the world. We're going to feel like we're the ones that are off base sometimes because the majority of people around us haven't set their affections on the same things that we do. In fact, their affections are set on things that don't belong to us anymore. That disjointedness is actually evidence of your new life in Christ. It's not a problem. It's, 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 like, a, it's like evidence of what God is actually doing in you. That's a beautiful thing. And while we can now live with him and for him, one day everyone will have the capacity to see him the way that we do. What's truest about us in the world is not going to be hidden forever. 
you have been raised with Christ. So set your affection on heavenly things. But that's not all. You've been raised with Christ. And Paul continues and he explains how we need to kill what is trying to kill us. I'm going to pick up in verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you've taken off your old self with his practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Now, the first appeal that Paul makes here uh, seems pretty negative, okay? And he uses extremely strong, blunt language to get his point across. Paul says, therefore, right? He's reminding them what he just said, right? Therefore, because you've been raised with Christ, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Now, that isn't Paul vying for some kind of, you know, separatist understanding of yourself. He's not saying like, oh, like separate yourself from the world, distance yourself from people who don't know Jesus. He's not, he's not saying that. It's not like a Buddhist understanding where somehow you'll come into a higher, higher knowledge or higher mentality. The phrase Paul uses here, belongs to your earthly nature, actually can be directly translated into members which are upon the earth. Okay, which is basically like limbs that are upon the earth. This is not a pretty illustration, but it's kind of like Paul is asking us to cut off the limbs that we have that are gangrenous or have gangrene in them. There's no mercy for a limb that's infected like that because there's no hope for it. And not only that, but it's eventually going to destroy the whole body. Paul is saying these things that we do that don't match our new life in Christ will eventually kill us. They'll kill us. Paul then goes through two different lists of things we're supposed to put to death or rid ourselves of. And neither of these lists are exhaustive. Okay, there's plenty more he probably could have put on these lists. But I think that these are explicit for a reason. Because honestly, I think that a lot of times we glaze over things where, because we think of things in general. And I think Paul really just wants to hone in on specifics. So there's no, there's no misunderstanding here. Now, the first list that he talks about is all about sexual sin. In the first list, sexual immorality has to do with any sexual activity outside of marriage, which was as common then as it is now. Impurity has to do with the impact immoral behavior has on our character. Lust refers to any passion that overtakes you, but in this instance, it is specifically referring to sexual desires. Evil desires come before lust, and while temptation itself is not a sin, evil desires that are cherished instead of killed, are in and of themselves dangerous. They're dangerous. And then Paul actually reveals kind of the, the puppeteer behind the scenes, and it's greed. Greed is wanting what isn't yours to the point where you sacrifice what is true about you in Jesus. All of these things are idolatry. We're all always in the process of worshiping something. And when we aren't worshiping God, we are worshiping something else. It's just as simple as that. That's the way that humans were created. We were created to worship. So if you're not worshiping God, there's something else that's commanding your affections. And I honestly think that because our sexuality is such a beautiful gift from God, it's one of the easiest things to turn into an idol. It's the easiest. And our culture has made broken sexuality, uh, our, our culture has made our broken sexuality easy to rationalize inside of the family of God because it's glorified outside the family of God. So it's easy to rationalize here. I mean, I hear rationalization about all kinds of things all the time. In fact, I'm guilty of some of it myself, okay? Everyone does it. It's your body, it's your life, it's more convenient, right? They're not meeting my needs. It can't hurt anyone. Or the rationaliz rationalization I hear a lot, particularly from women, is I'm afraid of being disappointing. Let me be really clear here. Paul is not saying human sexuality is evil. 
In fact, there is nowhere in all of scripture that even hints at that. Such a good and powerful gift that was given to us straight from the hand of God needs to be brought under the supremacy of Christ. That's all there is to it. You have been raised with Christ. Your sexuality should reflect that. But the second list is all about sins of anger. Now, the anger Paul describes here is not the righteous kind, okay? But it's the kind that seethes with hatred. And I, I actually, there's some things going on in my extended family right now where yesterday I was like, Lord, this anger that I'm feeling feels righteous. What part of it is righteous and what part of it is leading me into hatred? What part of it is leading me into hatred? And I haven't really figured it out yet, but I, re- that, I think that that's the key. And the part that he reveals that's leading me towards hating any human and belittling the image of God that's in him, I want to kill that. I want to kill it. Now, then he continues, rage, which is, is the physical manifestation of that seething. Malice is evil that intends to harm another person. Slander and filthy language both uh, have abusive intent, and they undermine the image of God in another person, but they undermine the image of God in the speaker as well. I think, actually, these gangrenous limbs, these ones, are harder to spot in people, and I actually think that we're much more sympathetic to them because we can hide them for a long, long time. The thing is, you might, you might not be able to prevent angry thoughts from springing up into your head, right? But you can dictate what happens with them. And either you kill them, or you let them take control of your tongue and worm their way into your heart. Paul also continues by making it clear all of the cultural and personal distinctions that were extremely important in ancient Rome that made it very easy to hate and be malicious and slander people had no place in the church. They could not be used as a breeding ground for all the evil that he listed. What camp you were in or what race you were or what social bracket you were in never dictates a person's value before God. Never. And thus, for the follower of Jesus, it can never dictate the value that we give somebody. This means, okay, and this is a hard one for me, this means that blowing off steam or venting about that person who is different from you isn't just unproductive, it's also dangerous. It's actually dangerous. And as a verbal processor, okay, that's me, I am constantly aware of how my words have the power to belittle to undermine, and to actually completely destroy the image of God in another person or in myself. You know, it's funny. I was my roommate one time. I I was cleaning the kitchen with her, and I dropped something, and I was like, oh, my gosh, McKenna. And she looked at me. She said, wow, McKenna's really a jerk to McKenna. And I was like, I didn't really think about that. But you're right. McKenna shouldn't be a jerk to McKenna. And I think think we're jerks to ourselves sometimes. But I think that even that kind of language around ourselves is insulting the image of God in us. I had a roommate in college who used to say, when I feel like I want to say something horrible about someone else, I imagine telling their parent the thing that I want to say. And then I remember that God is actually that parent. And no matter how justified I feel, he always asks, why are you speaking that way about my child? You have been raised with Christ. Your words should reflect that. Well, now, Paul, he doesn't really end there like with a, oh, how could you? How could you do stuff like that? It's despicable. Or something along the lines of, well, nothing's going to change. That's all. It's the way that you are. He reminds the church again, take off your old self with all of its practices and put on your new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of its creator. The word renewed here is key. He's saying, you have been raised with Christ. That is the starting point, not the def- destination. It's a starting point. The rest of your life is the process of you learning or being renewed so you can be the person that God has already made you to be. He's already made you into it. The fancy word for that is sanctification. The the process of practicing living into the identity we've been given in Christ. Are we going to be perfect? No, we're not going to be perfect. But life in Christ isn't like throwing a a dart at uh, at a bullseye. And then when you miss, you're like, well, I tried. No, it's more like learning to play an instrument. It's like learning to play an instrument. Doesn't matter how accomplished you get, you'll always miss a note once in a while. But the music you play 
It becomes more and more intricate and more and more beautiful as your skills grow. Your life reflects Jesus as you let him renew his image in you. You have been raised with Christ. As Paul continues, he wants to remind us that not only have we been raised in Christ, so we need to kill what doesn't belong in us, we also need to put on love. Verse 12, which i got to flip my page, okay. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Now, the mood here that Paul kind of brings out completely changes. It's almost like the fog has been burned off, and Paul switches from what we need to kill to what we need to cling to because of our new life in Christ. We have the same motivation to put on this new life as we had to kill the old life. We are God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, and we want to live according to that understanding of ourselves. Again, this is the starting point. It's not the destination. But Paul tells us, again, because this is true about you, put on your new clothes. Put them on. Clothes actually say a lot about us, don't they? Right? When you see uh, somebody walking through a grocery store parking lot wearing scrubs, you know they are a nurse, right? When you see a young man wearing a black robe and a very ridiculously designed cap that has a tassel hanging off of it, you know he is a graduate, right? You know when you see uh, someone walking down the street in a uniform and a star-shaped badge, you know they're a cop, right? I got engaged a few weeks ago. I know. Okay, but uh, it's funny because I was totally surprised. I had no idea it was coming. It took like a little while for it to actually sink in. And it didn't really seem real until I tried on a wedding dress. And I tried on a wedding dress and I looked in the mirror and I thought, wow, all of those years of watching Say Yes to the Dress and it's me. So interesting. (laughs) Our clothing often reflects that new life or changes that we're stepping into. Paul here is saying, okay, here is your new heart uniform. This is what you get up in the morning and you put on. Because you are brand new in Jesus, these brand new clothes are going to reflect that new life to the world. This list of virtues, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, they all create in us the capacity to interact with others just like Jesus interacts with us. And then Paul explains, and he goes a little bit deeper with that, and he says, okay, so how does this look? Well, the first thing he says is he tells us to bear with each other. You know how when we say something really that we know is going to be annoying or we know is going to be startling, we start with just bear with me here. Do you guys ever do that? I do that all the time. Okay, just bear with me here, okay? And it's like kind of this little like preface. Um, But Paul actually isn't using bear with one another in the same way, okay? We don't just bear with each other in the same way. It's not simply tolerating people that Paul is talking about here. No, in the body of Christ, we don't do that. We don't simply tolerate each other. That is, that's actually really incongruent with the new life that Jesus has given us. Are there people who are starkly different than we are here? Absolutely. Are there people here who, apart from the body of Christ, we would have no business even knowing? I certainly hope so. Are there people here who are going to feel you have nothing in common with? Yes. But guess what? We bear with each other because we want all people to experience wholeness in their humanity because that's what Jesus does for us. That's who we are now which means that we walk alongside people that are experiencing burdens and we share in their burdens with them. People aren't just projects, they're not stepping stones, and it doesn't matter actually if they're not convenient or efficient. It doesn't. Most of the time actually, bearing with someone the way that Jesus bears with us is not comfortable, it's not convenient, it's not efficient, but we reflect the life of Christ when we do. We bear with one another. But then Paul says, oh, and also we forgive each other for any kind of grievance. Why? Because Jesus, he forgave us for all of the grievances that we have done against him. It's been said that Christians should be the least offended people on the planet. That's really interesting. (laughs) Our life is with Christ, and he forgave us and then adopted us when we didn't deserve it. 
I think we often pay attention to uh, to a lot of the big life-altering moments that require a lot of focused forgiveness more than we pay attention to little tiny moments. In moments where your coworker makes a snarky comment that stings, or when your husband glances sideways at you and makes you feel stupid, or moments where you get talked over in community group. In those little moments, as much as in the big giant moments, because of our new life, we have the capacity to reflect the life we've been given in Christ when we forgive each other. And we can say something like, or internally, you know, Jesus has forgiven me of so much, there is no way I can hold that against them. Now, does that mean you just let everything brush under the rug? No, it means you bring it to the surface, actually. And like, it means that we should be the best at healthy conflict around here because we're the best at forgiving each other. Paul finishes talking about this new uniform that we live in by saying, over all of these things, over all of these different parts of your new uniform, put on love. Now, we live in California, where jackets are often optional, but if we lived somewhere else where the weather was more extreme, overcoats would not be an option. In the middle of a snowstorm, if you go out with just normal clothing on, you might as well be no, wearing no clothing at all. A coat is a way you literally stay alive. Now, that's the kind of binding that love does for our new life in Christ. It's the overcoat that makes all the other parts stay together and all of the other parts make sense. Our new life in Christ is a reflection of the love we've received from him. And now, because we know what that kind of love looks like, we have the capacity to reflect his love to others. You have been raised with Christ, so put on love. And then Paul continues and he says, you've been raised with Christ and because of that, we worship him together. Verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart since as members of one body you are called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish, or, oh, admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Now in the Roman world, there was this idea called Pax Romana, which meant Rome valued keeping the peace because they had so many different types of people in their empire. They valued keeping the peace and keeping everybody just okay more than anything because they didn't want to lose control. And in some sense, Paul is talking about a different version of peace for followers of Jesus. The difference is this peace is brought on by love, not by a desire for control. This peace allows us to live together in harmony, not because we have to, or because our differences are snuffed out by a controlling power, or because we hide what's really going on. That actually is not peace at all, and that's certainly not peace for the life of the follower of Jesus. We get to live in peace because for all of us, our affections are set on heavenly things. Our affections are set somewhere else. Jesus is our new home. No matter who you are, as a follower of Jesus, Jesus is is what you're shooting for. And our lives are meant to be lived worshiping him because of this. I dream about our church be becoming and being a place where we are so aware of our life in Christ, the way that we recognize each other calls us into a deeper, deeper relationship with God. What if our affections were so squarely set on heavenly things that we were free to love the people around us without any fear of being insulted, thought of as weird, taken advantage of, offended? What if we could become the type of people where our neighbors see who they truly are before God because of the way that we care for them? I think that we are being renewed into those people. You have been raised with Christ. Now we get to worship him together. So we've been raised with Christ we set our affections on heavenly things. We kill what's trying to kill us. We put on love and we worship him together. But what does all of this even mean? Why is it so important? It's pretty simple, actually. Because your new life reflects heaven. That's why it's so important. Your new life reflects heaven. Now, the last little verse is kind of the linchpin of this whole thing. Paul says, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, 
giving thanks to God the Father through him. When I was a little girl, my grandpa used to dance with me, and I would stand on his feet. Anybody ever done that with a little kid? Right? So you're dancing, and they're just standing on your feet, kind of going with, going with the music. Well, I wasn't good, okay? Uh, my legs were too short. My balance was really bad, and I slipped off the top of his loafer slippers all the time. I also never cared where we were going, but I loved it because my steps were a mirror of my grandpa's. And to me, it meant that I was dancing with him. And I loved him. I think that we make finding God's will far too complicated. I don't think it's like finding a needle in a haystack where if you find it, you, if you find it, great. If you don't find it, well, you probably just missed it. In this tiny verse, I think Paul is saying, hey, you know, it's not about what you do. It's about why and how you do what you do. Every step we take, whether our steps feel brilliant or clumsy, we take them in the name of Jesus because ultimately we just enjoy learning to dance with him. I promise you, if that's your goal, your new life will reflect heaven. And then when what was hidden is revealed, the life we've lived will have been a reflection of the glory of God all along. And we can say to him, Lord, my life was with you, and I just wanted to dance with you. And I think it's then that he's going to say, Beloved, as we were dancing, people saw me in you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the new life that we've been given because of your son, Jesus. Lord, we are so thankful that we don't have to worry about being perfect because you washed us clean in the resurrection, in the death and resurrection of your son. Lord, I thank you that we have eternal things in mind and that our hope is not here in the things that we experience now, but it's in the coming of your kingdom, which is now and not yet. Lord, thank you that you are so good to us. Thank you, Lord, that you just want to dance with us. And thank you, Lord, that you want to teach us to, to teach us how to live life with you, not because you're into some mold of human or some specific form of what a human's supposed to be like, but Lord, you created us to fill unique places. And Father, I just pray that today, um, if anyone is feeling convicted by any of the words that Paul wrote so long ago, pray, Lord, that you would just speak to them. I pray, Father, that you would whisper your words of love and encouragement. I pray, Father, that you would let conviction do its work. And I also pray, Father, that you would move us into, an, into this new life, that as we take steps towards you, that we would be renewed in the image of our Creator, Father. Lord, we thank you for who you are and for everything that you've given us because we are undeserving and we are loved and chosen and holy people anyway, God. Put all this in the hands of your son, Jesus, and all God's people said, amen.